Hi, I'm Miss Wondersmith, and welcome back to our Wonder Stitcher channel where we concoct multi sensory fairy tales for the modern world. My partner and I work together to create the immersive experience that comes from combining an original fairy tale with some sort of magical, weird, edible creation. Today, we're gonna start with some of the props from our latest project Amanita mushrooms! And while I delve into how I sculpted all of these clay mushrooms, I'm also going to dive into the history and lore of Amanitas. You along for the ride? So because I know you're curious, this is Model Magic by Crayola. It's kind of a foamy, lightweight clay. I wanted to make sure that I used a material that was light enough to support itself for this project. And I used bamboo skewers in the stalks. Um, I won't be talking a lot about the how-to during this video just because I think it's pretty self-evident, but I will pop in with notes if necessary. Anyways, um, I've always been really fascinated with Amanita muscaria, which is also known as fly agaric um, and is probably the most recognizable mushroom in popular culture. It's kind of known as the fairy tale mushroom. There's good reason for that too. Amanitas can be toxic. They can be mind-altering, they can be edible, they can be deadly, depending on the concentrations and preparation. To me, they embody the archetype of a trickster, of something that's meant to guide you a little bit deeper into those dark woods. And you'll see that reflected in our fairy tale, which is interesting because um, my partner and I didn't really talk about that, but it's just kind of such a pervasive idea that it made it into the story anyways. Amanitas have been a sacred hallucinogen for many cultures all over the globe, probably most notably in northern Eurasia. There's even kind of a pervasive cultural myth that they have a lot more to do with Christmas than you might think at first glance. And I think it's really fascinating, so we're going to dive right into that. But before we do, I just want to let you know what's in that bowl is watered down glue or Mod Podge. And I'm using fabric strips to add some texture and dimension to the stalks. Anyway, back to me nerding out about muscaria. <laughs> so the first thing to know about Amanita muscaria is that, like most mushrooms, it has a symbiotic relationship with certain trees. That means that it's mycelium and the tree roots work together and both of them benefit. And one of the trees that Amanita has a symbiotic relationship with is spruce trees. So you can often find Amanita mushrooms growing in spruce forests under the trees like little presents. Now let's travel to a region where Amanita muscaria prosper and have been used spiritually by several different communities. Northern Siberia. To the nomadic people that lived in this region, the universe and the past, present, and future took the form of a metaphorical tree, with history being the roots, the present being the trunk, and the future being the tip of the tree, which they believed to be the North Star. It was a traditional ritual in this group of people to have some of the important members of the tribe and the shaman gather together on the darkest night of the year, the winter solstice, to imbibe in this substance and go on a spiritual journey. They believed they were traveling up the trunk of the tree to the North Star, where they would find answers about the coming year or receive blessings. So not only did Amanitas have a connection to the physical spruce trees in the forests, they also had a connection to the spiritual vision of a tree that was their way of understanding the beyond. The shaman or medicine man of each tribe was tasked with procuring this wild medicine um, and in honor of the mushrooms would often dress in bright red clothes that had sometimes had white spots or white trim which Let's be honest, sounds a little bit familiar, right? That's a pretty specific outfit. Then they would go out and harvest the amanitas growing beneath the trees. Now, when consumed raw, amanitas are quite toxic. So one of the ways that they decrease the toxic effects was to dry them. 
Um, sometimes they were hung in the branches of those trees like animals do when they're drying mushrooms for later, hence Christmas ornaments. And sometimes they were put in a sock over the fire to dry slowly in the smoke, um, which is maybe where we get our stockings. Then the shaman would enter through the top hole of the yurt, um, the smoke hole, because by that time of year, often there was too much snow around the doorway to enter. So everybody just kind of went up and out the top. That was not quite a chimney. The similarities don't end there though. Have you ever wondered about flying reindeer? Because I definitely have. I, I just, I'm not sure how flying reindeer really fit in with the Christianity version of what Christmas means. And the answer is that the nomadic people of Northern Siberia were reindeer herders. And those reindeer really liked the mushrooms too. Um, when they ate them, they would start leaping into the air, jumping really high. And if you combine reindeer jumping really high with being high on mushrooms yourself, it seems like only a tiny leap to flying reindeer. Another interesting thing about the reindeer is that they can process toxins that humans can't process. So they would eat the mushrooms, they would urinate on the snow, and then that yellow snow was considered a safer way to experience the psychedelic effects of these mushrooms. Which may seem a little bit icky to our culture today, but was actually pretty ingenious. So just to recap, we have the tree of the universe with a star at the top. We have the gifts that grow under the trees, the ornaments that hang on them, the one that understood their magical powers, dressed up in red to honor them, then entering through the top of the yurt and putting them in stockings and giving them as a gift. And then to top it all off, we've got flying reindeer. Now, as far as I know, these are mostly just theories. Um, put forth by some anthropologists and probably some curious researchers on the internet. But I do find those connections really fascinating. Interestingly, a lot of Christmas cards from the Victorian era also feature fly agarics. And whether or not that's because of some um, knowledge of that connection or if they were just the right colors for the holiday is a little bit unclear, but it's pretty interesting to look up old Christmas cards and see so much visual depiction of these mushrooms. I've also noticed them cropping up in more commercial spaces for Christmas, like at big box stores are offering Amanita themed Christmas decorations, which I think is really interesting. What most of us recognize as Christmas here in North America is definitely an amalgamation of multiple cultures and spiritualities. Traditions and stories are adapted and changed, and every belief system and generation crafts its own version of Christmas. I personally connect really strongly with the symbolism of these beautiful fairy tale mushrooms and every time I come across real ones in the wild, it feels absolutely magical. Like they have this bewitching energy to them that I, it makes me feel greatly honored to be in their presence. That's why it was so fun to conceive this whole project around Amanitas and work collaboratively to develop a whole new fairy tale incorporating them. I'm really excited to keep showing you steps along the process so that you can see how it all comes together into our completed, finished, beautiful photographs. A lot of layers go into my work and there are even more layers in this project because there's a whole other person working alongside me. But check out those beautiful finished Amanitas. And thanks for joining me for a big nerd session. Rain Stitcher and I are so happy to have you along for this adventure and we can't wait to share the full fairy tale with you. Make sure to check in next Fairy Tale Friday to see the next step. Until then, magic always.